trigonometry. So in trigonometry, you would have learned about special triangles to start with. Two special triangles. First one is the isosceles right triangle, uh, the 45, 45, 90 triangle. Uh, if it's isosceles, we know that these two sides are the same length. Some people will teach you to label these 1, 1, and then Pythagorean theorem will tell you this is root 2. Or maybe you could label these two sides whatever you want. It'll be equivalent ratios. It could be some people will say to label it root 2, root 2, then Pythagorean theorem will tell you that that's 2. doesn't matter. Uh, it'll work out the same in the end. Uh, the second special triangle is um, the split in half equilateral triangle. So it was a 2 by 2 by 2 equilateral triangle, 2 by 2, and then this one's cut in half, so 1 equilateral triangle. Equilateral means that all the angles were 60, 60, and then the 60 was cut in half, so that's 30. If we use Pythagorean theorem to solve for this side, it would be root 3. So those are your two special triangles. And we can use those special triangles to write exact values for, tr for different trig ratios. For example, if we want the trig ratio for sine of 150, we want the exact value. First thing you would do is you would look at your Cartesian plane and know where 150 goes. Keeping in mind, each um, the initial arm always starts on the positive x-axis, then it rotates counterclockwise, 90, 180, 270, and then back 360 degrees back to where it started. So 150, the terminal arm would finish right there. And for 150, uh, the reference angle for 150 is always the angle between the, ter between the terminal arm and the x-axis. So the reference angle between 180 and 150 is 30 degrees. And what we can do is we can use our cast rule, C-A-S-T, to know that we can use a reference angle, uh, we can use the reference angle 30 to write the trig ratio for 150 and know that the trig ratio, because we're in the sine quadrant, the trig ratio is going to stay positive. So what we can do is we can use the, we can use uh, sine 30 to write the ratio for 150. So sine 150 is equal to the ratio of its reference angle. So sine 50 is equal to sine of 30 degrees. And we know what sine 30 is from our special triangle. Sine 30 is equal to opposite right hypotenuse, one over two. How about cos 225? Let's do the same thing here. 225. 225, so 0, 90, 180, 270, 225. That terminal arm would be here. The reference angle between the terminal arm and the x-axis would be 45 degrees. And don't forget your cast rule. Because we are in the tan quadrant, that means the tan ratio is the only ratio that's positive. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to keep in mind the cosine ratio is going to have to be made negative. So we can use the reference angle um, for cos 225. The reference angle is 45. We can use that reference angle, but because we're in the tan quadrant, we have to make the ratio negative. Tan is the only ratio positive in that quadrant. So it's equal to negative cos 45. And cos 45 from the special triangle, cos of 45 adjacent over hypotenuse, gives us negative 1 over root 2. If we do what's called rationalizing the denominator, or if we use the other special triangle I drew with the root 2, root 2, 2, uh, you would get negative root 2 over 2. Either is fine, they're equivalent. More with trig. So coterminal angles. So what's a coterminal angle? They're angles that have the exact same terminal arm. So 60 degrees would be approximately here. Is there any other amount we could rotate from the initial arm to get to this same spot? So if we think logically, we're here, if we rotate another 360 degrees, we would get right back to the exact same spot. So if we added 360 to 60, that's 420 degrees. So if you rotate 60 degrees, you get here. If you rotate 420 degrees, so like 60 and then another 360, you get right back to the same spot. How about if we do it again? If we rotate another 360 from that 420 degrees, you're right back in the same spot again. So if we rotate another 360, that's 780 degrees. All three of those angles would land you in the exact same spot. They all have the exact same terminal arm. We'd say those angles are all coterminal.
related angles um, are angles that don't have the same terminal arm, but they have the same trig ratio. So there's always two angles between 0 and 360 that have the same trig ratio. So let's see how that works. So find two angles between 0 and 360 that have a tan ratio of negative 0 0.32. So <clears throat> if we picture our Cartesian grid and you remember your cast rule, our tan ratio is negative. And the tan ratio is going to be negative in two spots. Uh, it's going to be negative in a sine quadrant and a cosine quadrant. It's going to be negative in two spots. If we use your calculator to solve for the angle, your calculator will only give you one of those two answers. We'll have to use the reference angle to find our second uh, of the two answers. So to find your first angle, so to find the first angle, uh, we can just do inverse tan of the ratio. Oh, I should write theta 1 equals Theta 1 equals inverse tan of, oh, it was negative 0 0.32. So if I do inverse tan of negative 0 0.32, so make sure in degree mode, negative 0 0.32, evaluate negative, approximately, I'm going to round negative 17.7. Negative 17.7. Now, um, that's not between 0 and 360. So we have to change this to a positive angle. We have to change this to an angle between 0 and 360. So change it to a positive angle. Just quickly add 360 to it, and it tells you an equivalent positive angle between 0 and 360. So 342.3. Three. That's equal to 342.3 degrees. So that angle is 342.3. The terminal arm would be about here, and the reference angle is negative 17. Is sorry, is 17.7 degrees. That's the reference angle there. So um, <clears throat> what we want to do? So the calculator gave us our answer in this quadrant. So it gave us the answer of 342.3. If we want the second answer, we have to place the same reference angle of 17.7. Looks a little more like that. 17.7 in the other quadrant where the tan ratio is going to be negative. It's in this quadrant here. So this terminal arm, um, we have to figure out how far we have to rotate to get to this terminal arm. So we fell short of 180 by 17.7 degrees. So what we're going to have to do is calculate how far did we have to rotate to get to here. So we fell 17.7 short of 180. So to find theta 2, we would do 180, subtract our 17 0.7 degrees and we'd get 162.3 uh, degrees. So 162.3 degrees. So here 162.3 and what we have figured out is that tan of both of these angles 342.3 and tan of 162.3 approximately because we've rounded should equal negative 0.3 Two. And we can just do a quick check. Tan 342.3, that equals about negative 0 0.32. And tan of 162.3 should be the same thing. Yep, about negative 0 0.32. Last uh, trig geometry question here. Point negative 0.34. Well, where's that? Negative 0.34, just approximately. It's about there. It says it lies on a terminal arm. If I connect that down to here, visualize my triangle. Uh, it says state all six, six trig ratios for the angle theta uh, to rotate to that terminal arm. So to get to this point, negative 3, 4, I would have had to move 3 that way and then 4 that way. Pythagorean theorem would tell me that the hypotenuse is 5. I can use uh, the reference angle in here to state my ratios as long as I remember the cast rule that sine is going to be the only primary ratio that is positive in this quadrant. So the sine ratio is going to be positive. Sine of the angle is equal to opposite right hypotenuse 4 over 5. The cosine I'm going to have to make negative because it's in the sine quadrant. So cosine of the reference angle is equal to negative adjacent over hypotenuse, negative 3 over 5 
and tan is also going to be negative because we're in the sine quadrant. Tan opposite over adjacent, negative 4 over 3. Uh, and notice it says all six tr trig ratios. So these are the three primary. Uh, we're also going to write the reciprocal trig ratios. So reciprocal to sine, we say that that is the cosecant ratio. So cosecant of the same angle is equal to just the reciprocal of the sine ratio. So 5 over 4. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, so it's equal to negative 5 over 3, we just flip it. And cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, so we just flip the tan ratio and we get negative 3 over 4. Trig identities. Let's just do one identity example. Uh, some of the primary identities that are usually given to you, um, we have the reciprocal identities. Uh, so like we just reviewed, cosecant secant and cotangent are the reciprocals of, so cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, secant is the reciprocal of cosine, and cotangent is the reciprocal of tan. Quotient identity, tan theta is equal to sine theta over cos theta, and remember we could also apply that to cotangent. Cotangent is the reciprocal of tan, so it would equal cos over sine, and the Pythagorean identity, sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1. And we, we could rearrange this equation, right, uh, to isolate different things. So if I wanted to isolate sine squared, I would get 1 minus cos squared equals sine squared. I could isolate cos squared and get 1 minus sine squared equals cos squared. And there's other things we can do here. Like I could square both sides of these ones or these ones and get a, we could get other identities. Um, but we're going to use these primary identities to prove more complex identities. So improving an identity like this one here, you set it up into left side, right side, no crossing between the sides. And we go ahead and try and show that these two sides are equivalent to each other. So on the left side, we have tan squared x, it could be a theta, it doesn't really matter, plus cos squared x plus sine squared x. And on the right side, we have 1 over cos squared x. And we're going to try and show that these are equivalent to each other. So you can start working with either side. I'm going to start working with the left. Tan squared, if you remember your quotient identity, it's equal to sine squared over cos squared. So sine squared x over cos squared x. And here I have cos squared plus sine squared. Remember, cos squared plus sine squared is 1. So I could write, I could change this whole thing here to just a 1, so plus 1. And I'm going to want, when I'm adding fractions, I'm going to want a common denominator. So I'll change this 1, right? This 1 is a 1 over 1. Multiply it top and bottom by cos squared, and it becomes a cos squared cos squared x over cos squared x. I'm going to have to move this second one down here. Now that I have a common denominator, I could write it as one fraction. So I have a sine squared plus a cos squared all over cos squared. Well, sine squared plus cos squared is 1, so I have a 1 over cos squared. Oh, look. This, what I now have on the left side, is equivalent to what I have on the right side. So I've just proven the identity. So we can just quickly write left side equals right side. We've proven the identity using some of these primary identities that will be given to you up here. Um, just for time's sake, I'm not going to do another one right now. Um, uh, if you want to, you know, pause the video and try this one. But just for time's sake, I'm gonna, just going to move on to the trig functions section. <clears throat> so trig functions, what we did was we looked at how to actually graph what does sine x look like. So sine x, just really quickly... Uh, sign, if we did sine, we'll do, um, it's a periodic function, it does one cycle in 360 degrees, it means every 360 degrees the y values repeat. Um, when x is 0, sine of 0, the y value is 0. Sine of 90, it goes up to 1, back to 0, to negative 1, to 0. So the function looks like, goes from here, I'll just quickly label it 1, negative 1, goes up, down, further down, and back up, and that is one cycle of the sine function. And it would continue, and it would repeat every 360 degrees. Cosine function looks very similar to sine, but it starts up at 1, then goes down to 0, negative 1, back up to 0, back to 1.
so one negative one the cosine function starts up here down down up up and it's going to follow that same curved pattern and it would repeat every 360 degrees one thing important to note with the cosine function is that the maximum point is on the y-axis and for a sine function the max point isn't but if we draw a horizontal line through the middle of it this point right here that's on the y-axis we would call that the rising midline it's where the midline crosses with the rising side that's on the y-axis so for sine the rising midline is on the y-axis for cos a max is on the y-axis and then you'll we did some transformations of it but just some key characteristics about transform sine and cosine functions we could talk about uh, amplitude period and max min phase shift vertical shift so the amplitude I'm going to show you what the graph of this looks like just to help you visualize it. Uh, the amplitude is half of the vertical distance from the max to the min. So the half of the vertical distance, we take the max point, um, subtract the min, and then divide by 2. And that will tell us the amplitude. So the amplitude is half the vertical distance between the max and the min. So we want half of this. So we do max minus min divided by 2. Or if we have the equation, this value here tells us the amplitude of the function. That is our a value. So the amplitude is equal to the absolute value of a, which in this case is 4. If we did max minus min, we'd have 5 minus negative 3. That's 8 divided by 2, also 4. Period. The period of the function, if we have the equation, it's how long does it take to do one full cycle? And we get it by doing 360 over k. And our k value is here. So we do 360 over 3. And that tells us it takes 120 degrees to do one full cycle. And look, if we were to map off a cycle, so from here, trace along, there's one full cycle done. I should have done it in a different color. Here's one full cycle. That cycle it went from 0 to 120. It took 120. Period, 120. Uh, phase shift, that means how far did it shift left or right? So we can tell that from our d value. So we go left 30 degrees. And our c value tells us our vertical shift. Uh, vertical shift up 1. And the vertical shift value tells you where the middle of your function has moved to. So if I were to draw a dotted line horizontally through 1, you notice how that splits the function exactly in half. So that's our C value. The amplitude would be from the middle of the function to the top. So from 1 to 5, the amplitude is 4. If we want our max point, and keep in mind you're not always going to have the graph, you should be able to tell from the equation. If we want the max point, you just go to your C value and add whatever the amplitude is, because the amplitude is half the vertical distance. So if we go to the middle and then add the amplitude, it takes us to the max. So the maximum value is equal to your C value plus the absolute value of A, your amplitude. So 1 plus 4 equals 5. And opposite, if we want the midpoint, you would go to your C value and then just subtract the amplitude, and that would take you to the bottom. So C minus the absolute value of A. So 1 minus 4, negative 3. Notice the lowest it ever goes, negative 3. We want to also be able to go the other way. We want to be able to go, uh, you know, given the graph of a function, be able to write its equation. So if we want to write the equation, we're going to need to know A, the amplitude, K, D, and C. A, the amplitude, it's half the vertical distance. So we want half of that distance. So to get that, we do the max minus min over 2. So the maximum is 6. The min, negative 6. So 6 minus negative 6 over 2, 12 over 2, 6. The amplitude is 6. That's the A value of our equation. K, we can get by doing 360 divided by the period. So the period is how far horizontally does it take to do one full cycle so one full cycle there's one cycle and then that cycle repeats 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 so that cycle took 
90 degrees. So to calculate the K value, I just do 360 divided by 90, and I get 4. Uh, C value is the next easiest one to find. I'm going to want to figure out where horizontally is the middle of this function. And I can get to that by just doing max minus my absolute value of a, my amplitude. So my maximum point is six. If I subtract the amplitude of six, I figure out the middle of the function is at zero. And that should make sense. If I draw my horizontal line through zero, that looks like it cuts the function exactly in half. D value. So if you remember the D value of the parent function of cosine, uh, or sorry, the, the maximum point for the parent function of cosine is right on the y-axis. So if I want the d value for cosine, I'm looking for where has the maximum point moved to. And notice on this one, the maximum point is still right on the y-axis. So the d value for cos, the horizontal shift, it hasn't been horizontally shifted at all. d value for cos is equal to zero. But I could also write this equation with the sine function if I wanted to. Uh, I could find a d value, if I want to write it as a sine function, I would have to know where has the rising midline moved to, right? For the parent sine function, the rising midline was on the y-axis. Well, notice for this one, the rising midline is over here. But what's the value of that point there if you can't exactly see? Well, what's the relationship between uh, the distance between a max and a rising midline? We look back to the parent function, the distance between a max and a rising midline is always the distance between here and here, it's always 90. And then we would divide that by whatever horizontal stretch or compression has happened. Divide that by your K value, and that would tell you the distance. So anytime you see a maximum point, like here's a max, if we look 90 over K to the left, there's a rising midline. So here, if we want D sine, well, we know where d cos is, so we just take d cos, and if we move 90 over k to the left, that'll tell us where the rising midline is. And our k value for this function, so our d cos, sorry, is 0, and our k value is 4, so it's been horizontally compressed by a quarter. Uh, what we get is 0 minus 22.5. Negative 22.5 is our sine value. So that's telling us the rising midline has been moved to negative 22.5. So I can write two equations. I can write a sine or a cos equation. So if I want to write my cos equation, it's 6 cos 4x. And then uh, there is no c value. c value is just 0, so that would be it. If I want to write a sine equation, 6 sine for x plus 22.5. Those are equivalent equations. Both those equations would give you the graph of this function here. And one more application question, and then this is it for grade 11 functions. So the Ferris wheel carnival rotates counterclockwise, diameter of 18 meters, and descends to 3 meters above the ground level at its lowest point. Assume that a rider enters a car from a platform 40 degrees around the rim before the car reaches its lowest point. Model the height above the ground using a sine and cosine function. So what we have here, we've got our Ferris wheel. It's propped up by some type of platform that is three meters above the ground. So the platform, three meters above the ground, and it says the wheel has a diameter of 18 meters. So that means the highest the rider will ever be above the ground is 21 meters, and the lowest while they're on the ride is three meters. And it tells us they get onto the ride at a platform, this is where they start, that is 40 degrees around the rim before the lowest point. And we want to model the rider's height above the ground using a transformed sine and cosine function, uh, so height above the ground as the rider rotates around. So for the equation, we're going to need a, k, d, and c. So let's start by finding the a value, the amplitude. Amplitude equals max minus min over 2. So 21 minus 3 over 2. So that gives us 9. K is 360 divided by the period. Period is, well, how long will it take the rider to do one complete revolution around? It'll take them 360 degrees. So 360 over 360, K value is 1. C 
is the middle horizontally of this function. So we're looking for, you know, kind of like what is the middle height they're going to be at. And to get to that, we just do our max minus our amplitude. And that gives us 12. The more difficult part of this is to get our d value, and we want it for cos and for sine. So the d value for cos, remember we're looking for where's the maximum point? Well, how far is this, ro this rider going to have to rotate and until they get up here to the maximum height? Well, they're going to have to rotate 40 degrees plus another 180. So 40 plus 180, 220. So for cos, we're looking for how far to the max. For sine, we're looking how far to the rising midline. Rising midline is halfway between the min and the max on the way up. So how far do they have to rotate to get from the start to here? So they'd have to go 40 plus only 90 more, so 130. So D for sine, 130 degrees. And for to write our equations, let's do our cos one first. Our amplitude was 9, so Y equals 9 cos x minus 220, and our C value was 12. For sine, an equivalent sine equation, y equals 9, sine x minus 130, plus 12. All right, so that's all the main things from the grade 11 functions course. Uh, I hope that helps you in your exam prep. Go to jensenmath.ca for more stuff.